By Tillette, Thatched, Commercial. We're your high street insurance brokers for all types of insurance. Avoid faceless internet firms. High house insurance, do it face, do it face. See Neil and the friendly team at High Street Selsey. High house insurance, do it face, do it face. Or call Selsey 606 552. Hello, this is Mary Kennedy. Welcome to this week's programme. We have an interview with Kevin Byrne of Check It Trade. Lynn has a recipe for bread, Mike tells us about adult sports, and Giles has gardening tips. First I'll tell you what's on in Selsey over the coming week. On Bank Holiday Monday, 26th of May, the Academy have a car boot sale from 8 o'clock. Two of our local churches have events this week. St Peter's Church Spring Fair is on Monday the 26th from 12 till 3 and St Wilfrid's Plant and Cake Fair is on Saturday the 31st from 10 till 12. Also on Saturday the 31st, a mini beast safari at Pagham Harbour Visitors Centre from 11 till 1. And looking ahead to next Sunday the 1st of June, the D-Day Festival runs from 10.30 till 6. Lots of posters around the town with details of that. Now I'll hand you over to Hugh and Kevin. So we've got Kevin Byrne in here from uh, from Checker Trade. He's talking to to Hugh Grove for Sales Internet Radio. Kevin, you just won an award. What one was it? Ah, I can never remember the correct words. <laughs> I think it's the Queen's Award for Enterprise in Innovation. Okay, fine. And when did you receive it? Uh, I got notification that we had been finalised or shortlisted uh, a good six months ago. Right. And then we actually found out, I personally found out that we'd been awarded the award about two months ago and I had to keep that under wraps until about a month ago. So a bit like reunited really. Well it is part of the Queen's honours. It, yeah. it's, it's David Cameron's office that uh, judges and it's all past the Queen and yeah. it's the Queen that says, yeah, the, this is... Uh, this is a, a company that's uh, good enough to get the, the, the Queen stamp. Well, Kevin, you started this business just after the storm, didn't you? The storm of 1998, the tornado, the yeah. famous one. Yeah, I mean, there's... That's uh, the year we lost the roof off our house. Is it? Was yeah. it during the storm? Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Um, I personally wasn't affected, yeah. uh, apart from a side door being blown off, but I could fix that myself. But there were lots of rumours about cowboys being stopped coming into Celsi. You know, have they got an MOT certificate? Have they got ball tyres? Have they got tax on their vehicles? And Do they, they know what they're doing? Talking, talking to various people in the past, there was something like 117 vehicles that were stopped by the police coming into Celsi. And uh, I think the insurance companies picked up a lot of the the over expense yeah. or, or, or the, the vastly exaggerated prices to put six or seven tiles yeah. straight but people were ripped off and it sort of prompted me it prompted me to start looking and thinking about is there an answer to the road trade problem yeah. and my dad when he was alive was a trading standards officer in the last few years of his life so he used to come home and and give me all sorts of tales about road trades and stuff. So I had that little bit of uh, input into my life revolving around road trades. But I looked at the guilds, I looked at the federations, I looked at local government and central government. And back then, trading standards was still called weights and measures. And there really wasn't an answer to the road trade problem. So I started to call various people that I knew that were tradesmen and, and basically saying to them, Look, if we could, if we could all come together, if you could show me your qualifications, your public liability insurance, and particularly if you had letters of recommendations from your customers, that, you know, you've done a good job. They'd written back to you and said, you know, you've done a great job because there was no internet back then. There was no yeah, reviews. Sure. Yeah. All, all you basically had was a letter from a happy customer yeah. as a recommendation. I started to put that together and it was very, very, very tough. You know, four, five, six years went by and my friends were still saying to me, why are you, why are you flogging a dead horse, Kev? You'll never get this off the ground. I, I, are you making any money from this yet? Yeah. And it was, no, 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 I'm not. But I, I believe it. I, it's going to break. It's yeah. going to happen. And, uh, you know, people often use the, the phrase, it nearly killed me. It, it didn't nearly kill me, but it was very, very tough. Yeah. 
um, working for nothing for years and years and years. Yeah. It was tough. But you obviously believed it. Absolutely believed it, particularly when the internet started to come along. Roughly round about 1999, 2000, it started to, to get a little bit of a foothold. And, I, and it instantly dawned on me, wow, you know, if, if I could take reviews now of customers, you know, all these letters I was getting from trades yeah. for them to join, if I could take those and put it on the internet and make it easy for my customers being the tradesmen to get more reviews yeah. from their customers, that would be really good. Yeah. So um, I'm pretty sure I've got a claim to fame that I was the first in the world to do online reviews. Okay. And that's that went a long way to winning the Queen's Award well, and be back, in, in innovation because so no one how many doing... how many tradesmen at the moment are actually checked by Checker Trade? Um, roughly fourteen and a half thousand. And are they largely in the south or or, or all over England? They, I, I would say, in the south, we've probably got about twelve thousand. Okay. And the rest are up and down the UK. Okay. And what are the real advantages to being checked by you? Well, you mean from a tradesman point of view? No, from 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 a, from from a, from, a, from a customer's point of view. From a customer's point of view, well, the first thing that I'll say, there is not a one hundred percent guarantee in any scheme. Right. All we can do at Checker Trade is our best. Yeah. And 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 this is our best. Yeah. Uh, when a tradesman contacts us because we don't call them they call us saying tell me about check trade because yeah. we're that powerful now yeah. uh, we will say well before we take this conversation any further you will be interviewed you will be thoroughly vetted you will be continuously monitored and all the results will be made public are you happy with that so that's their first hurdle they have to be happy with that yeah. and then we will go out and interview them yeah. we won't see them on site and we won't see them in a in a greasy diner not that there's any greasy diners in Celsius, of course but we want to see them in their fixed abode yeah we want to know that they are not travelers yeah so uh, and we want proof that they live or operate from that fixed abode okay then we want to see their insurance documents their qualifications if government regulations require them we want six to ten customers names and addresses which we will call yeah uh, we want to see proof of ID a driver's license or a, um, a passport we will do a credit check on them if they're a limited company and then from that point uh, they're continuously monitored via customer feedback okay so in the average year well let's just take last year how many complaints from the public did you have about checker trade tradesmen last year? Because you that's a really good. Up. That's a really good. I, 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 I can give you a, a generic answer to that. Yeah. On average, we will get one complaint per member every two years. Wow! But that doesn't mean that complaint's a genuine one. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are rogue homeowners out there yeah. who are expecting more than what they're paying for. Okay. And and that that is uh, there's just as many rogue homeowners than That's there are rogue trades. Trade, yeah, okay. Some complaints are upheld. Yeah. And if it's a serious offence and we warrant it serious enough to kick that tradesman off, we will kick that tradesman off. Okay. Um, if it's if it's well, I stayed in all day and the guy didn't turn up. Yeah. And then the tradesman turns around and says, "I knocked on their door for five minutes and no one answered it." Where do you go with that complaint? Yeah. Because you've got one word against the other, so yeah. it, it's it's very very contentious that element of what we do, but we do our best. All right, well, um, that's fair enough. And sometimes we fail, and sometimes we get it right. So, and have, you, you you reckon that there are twelve thousand uh, South Coast tradesmen now? About that many, yeah. And that covers all the trades. Yeah, I can't think of a trade we we wouldn't cover. And anything to have your home or garden improved, maintained, or extended. Okay. Now, uh, you're quite a large employer in Selby. How many people do you employ now? 165. And are they largely from Selby? Um, there's, a, there's a large percentage from Selby, but we do have uh, a percentage that will come from Chichester, Bognor Regis. Okay. Uh, and we've also got an office in Newcastle. Yeah. Uh, the office in Newcastle has eight or nine people. And then we have what we call membership consultants. Uh, we've got quite a few of those that are dotted around the UK okay. because we have to go and visit the trades before they sign up. So to send them all from Celsi to 
to various parts of the UK is uh, very expensive. So we employ people up and down the UK. All right. Now, if you think of your operation in Celtic, I've heard rumours in the village that you're selling a, uh, the piece of land opposite with your premises. Uh, and that, that is prior to moving to Chichester, is that on the cards or what? We have looked at various options and we did go through a period of looking at pieces of land in Chichester yeah. and in the end I came back to the belief that there are some uh, really, really good reasons to stay in Selsey. Mm-hmm. I, I am a committed Christian yeah. and, and I can remember many, many years ago when I was a young lad, I, I used to walk around Selsey, the complete perimeter of Selsey, yeah. just praying for Selsey and praying for right. the residents in Selsey. And um, I, I, I just believe that when I was looking at these additional pieces of land in, in, in Chichester, I, I was just reminded of that and the importance of that and that there is almost like a special blessing for my company within Celsi. Yep. So I I've, think that's true. So I've decided to stay in Celsi. So that piece of land is not being sold. Uh, over, over the next 12 to 18 months, it will be developed into additional offices for my staff. Okay, so you're settled in Celsi and, no, and not going anywhere? That's the plan today. Okay, fine. I've also been told by my wife, who's a friend of your wife, that you're a marathon man. How many marathons do you run a year? Well, at the moment, I'm running one marathon a month right. to raise money for a mentally handicapped school uh, just outside of uh, Portsmouth. In, in, um, and is Fireton. it a full marathon or a half marathon? It's a full marathon. What, 26 month. miles? 26.2 miles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I've done 10 this year. Yeah. Um, I've got two more coming up. I've got one uh, not well, it this keeps slim, doesn't it? Well, I, this bit doesn't go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so the money goes for, the, for, for this school? It does, yeah. I was quite shocked. I was looking at, at trying to find a project around about £100,000. Yeah. And uh, we just couldn't find one. We, we went to the hospices. Yeah. And the great results of speaking to these uh, places is that they, that they didn't have any projects, yeah. which I thought was great news yeah. for them. Yeah. But it, um, it wasn't great news for us. In the end, we, we sort of cast our net a little bit further and we started to look at... Uh, schools, and we came across this school for 11 to 16 year olds in Farlington, just north of Portsmouth. And um, I was just shocked. You know, even now, I, I can't believe I'm saying this. Can you can you think of going into a modern secondary, primary, or secondary school today and not find disabled toilets or no, not find no. disabled showers? Yeah. And this is a school for mentally handicapped children. Yeah. And in the 60s, a lot of the parents of some of the children that went there, they built a swimming pool. Yeah. And part of that swimming pool was two changing rooms. Yeah. But basically, they are concrete block with wooden slats to, to sit on. They're six by eight. And mentally challenged children are in these rooms, unheated, with outside doors, uh, to get changed for all their sporting facilities. And I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Even now, I can't believe I'm saying it. Yeah. So the, the swimming pool has been deemed as okay. Yeah. So we are knocking down the changing rooms, which are just basically uh, concrete sheds. We're rebuilding that with modern, heated, proper disabled male and female changing facilities. And we're also building right down the side of the swimming pool another section with with lockers and and okay, an right. area like that but it's costing 130,000 and how, that's why I'm running the marathon how much have you raised so far well it's not so much how much money I've raised because the commitment to cover the 130,000 is coming in two ways it's coming in via money but it's also coming in with tradesmen sure. saying I'll do the electrics yeah and um, I've got to take my hat off to Grafton's. Yeah. Uh, people might not know Grafton's, but they will know Build Base, and we've yeah. got a Build Base in Celsi, of course. Yeah. Uh, Grafton's have said we'll supply all the materials, really, which is a, a hefty, a hefty chunk of that hundred and thirty thousand. Yeah. And with the with the willingness of tradesmen and other companies coming forward saying we'll supply the tiles, we'll supply the adhesives, it's yeah, we're just about there, uh, cash wise. I've raised running marathons along with 
with uh, a lot of members of my staff helping me raise this money, I think we're probably on about 17,000. But the big push is, is the next sort of two months for raising money. I haven't really gone to my corporate friends and my suppliers yeah. saying, look, can you sponsor me now? Look, I've done 10, I've got two to go. You know, <laughs> put your hands in your pocket. So I'm hopeful to get another 15,000 in the next couple of months. Okay, that's brilliant. Can we, can we interview you again in about two months' time when, when the work's either finished or just started? Well, the works will start during the summer, summer holidays. Right. The, because of the, the, the health and safety with the children being yeah. around there, uh, we have to get the groundwork done yeah. whilst they're not at school. Okay. As long as the groundworks are done, that's fine. So we've got six weeks to do the groundworks, but we're hopeful that the whole project will be finished in about three months from the start of the summer holidays. Okay. Kevin, thanks a lot. Talk to you again soon. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Next comes Lynn's homemade bread recipe. Hi, it's Hugh Graham talking uh, with Lynn again. Lynn, what are we going to talk about this week? We're just going to make a nice basic homemade bread, Hugh, without a, without the aid of a bread making machine. Oh, right. So you're going to use a baking tin? We are, and we're going to use our hands and some elbow grease. Okay, fine, got it. Okay. So for this particular recipe for bread, and there are lots of them out there, but this is quite a good one, one kilogram of strong bread flour, which you can buy anywhere. Yeah. All right. 625 mils of tepid water. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know what tepid means, it means just off cold. Yeah. All right, nearly warm. 30 grams of fresh yeast or 3, 7 gram sachets of dried yeast. It really Did doesn't matter. Did you get matter. that from Tesco's? Do you? Yeah. yeah, I think you can get it from just about anywhere. Yeah, but Tesco's is particularly good. It's cheap too. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Tesco's for your dried yeast and probably the flour as well, the strong bread flour. Yeah. Two tablespoons of sugar, one level tablespoon of fine sea salt and some extra flour for dusting. Yep, yeah, fine. Okay. Here's what we do then. Improve the yeast. So you mix the sugar, but you can use honey for this as well. It works just as well if you use honey. Or golden syrup. Oh, okay. I've not heard of that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. just something that the yeast can eat up, isn't that's it? Right, yeah. The yeast will eat yeah. it all up. With the tepid, with, that's just below body temperature, water, and let it sit, and the milk, or milk, and let it sit for about five to ten minutes until it's nice and foamy, so it yeah. starts to bubble. Add that to your flour and salt mixture. Temperature at 190 degrees Fahrenheit, centigrade, sorry, or 375 Fahrenheit for approximately 30 minutes. Yeah. If your bread is really dense, it's not been kneaded enough. Personally, I think you need to knead it for if you're doing it by hand for a good 25 minutes. Actually, yeah, yeah, sometimes even longer with wholemeal dough. And if you use all white flour, you should be kneading it for about 10 minutes, quarter yeah. of an hour. Pile the flour onto a clean surface. This is where we get to make a nice mess, right? Yeah, I've got a big marble slab thing that I use for this. Yeah. It's really yeah. good. Pile the flour onto a clean surface and make a large well in the centre. Pour half your water into the well and then add your yeast, sugar and salt and stir with a fork. Yep. Slowly, and this recipe says but confidently, which means don't be scared of this, bringing the flour from the inside of the well. You don't want to break the walls of the well or the water will go everywhere and you'll just have one sticky mess, all mm. right? Continue to bring the flour to the centre until you get a stodgy, porridgey consistency and then add the remaining water. Continue to mix until it's stodgy again. Then you can be a little bit more aggressive and bring in all the flour, making the mix less sticky for your hands. Um, flour your hands and pat and push the dough together with all the remaining flour. Some flours need a bit more water, some a little less. So if you're using a good, strong quality flour, good quality flour, you, you, you know, you should be fine. But just adjust it accordingly with, the, with how the dough feels. If it feels too yeah. dry, put a bit more water in. Okay, stage three, it says kneading, and this is where you get really stuck in and get your elbows mm. greased. With a bit of elbow grease, simply push, fold, slap, and roll the dough around over and over, just as hard as you like. Just yeah. pretend you're taking it right out on somebody that's done something wrong to you and, and really, really give that's it a good old... True, yes. Yeah, give it yeah. good old... Or something that's annoyed you. For four or five minutes until you have a silky and elastic dough. When we say silky, it does look... At, actually, it looks like gloss, quite glossy yes, by the time you've finished. And it's quite elastic. You can pull it apart like a dough boy. Flour the top of your dough and put it in a bowl and cover it with cling film. And this is what we call proving it, yeah. right? And then you want to keep it somewhere warmish 
for about half an hour until it's doubled in size. Not by an open window, obviously. Yeah. Airing cupboard's great. If you've got an old airing cupboard, then, mm-hmm. then fantastic place. This will improve the flavour and the texture of your dough. And it's always exciting to know that the old juice is kicked into action, isn't it? Yeah. It's lovely to start seeing it rise. And children especially love to see the bread rise. They, yeah. they, they find it fascinating. And then we want to do the second proving. So once the dough has doubled in size, knock the air out of it again for 30 yeah. seconds or so by bashing it and squashing it. So you yeah. think all that hard work and here we go again. And you can now shape it or flavour it as ever you require. Some people like to plait it at this stage or whatever kind of a, yeah. a bread you want to do. Folded, filled, tray baked or whatever. And leave it to proof for a second time for 30 minutes to an hour. So that again, it's doubled in size. This is the most important part as it's the second proof that they give it the air that actually ends up being cooked into your bread. Yeah. So you get a light, soft, fluffy bread. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with that second proving. So remember, don't fiddle with it. Let it just do its own thing. All yeah, right? Two. Very gently place your bread dough onto a flour dusting tray and into a preheated oven. Don't slam the door because it'll go bleh. Might yeah. it just be as flat as a pancake, or you'll lose the air that you need. And bake according to the time and temperature given with your chosen recipe. You can tell if it's cooked by tapping the bottom. Yeah. Did you know that? Yes. So if you tap the bottom, it sounds nice and hollow. Yeah. Then it's cooked. If it doesn't, pop it back in for a little longer. So if it feels, if you get it like yeah. a dud sound, a really horrible dud sound, then yeah. once it's cooked, you can place it on a rack and allow it to cool for a little bit. Well, try and leave it at least thirty minutes before you slap a load of butter on it. And, and get it in your gob, you. <laughs> yes. But um, it's fine, and it's very freezeable as well. When, uh, just a little thing that um, might be worth mentioning, when you dust in the, uh, the baking tins, mm-hmm. I put a thin layer of butter around. Okay. And then cover that with, and I find it causes the separation of the loaf a lot easier. Okay, yeah, yes. Yeah. Grease the tin. Grease okay, the tin. well, that's fine. Lovely. Now, next week, yes, you. we're going to do... A cheese and onion loaf. Okay. Aren't we? We are. All right. (laughs) See you next week. You take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Lynn. That sounds great. And over to Mike. All right. It's Hugh Graham for Chelsea Internet Radio. And I'm talking this morning with Mike Nichols about youth and about particularly about sport for youth in Chelsea. Mike, you're concerned with sports stream, aren't you? I am, yes. So, tell us about it. Well, it's a charity that was formed four years ago, um, partly to bring the football and cricket clubs together in a sort of joint project to build a new clubhouse, but also to develop a range of sporting activities in Selsey, so that uh, children, young people and adults could do things here, rather than having to travel into Chichester or Bognor or Portsmouth, you know, to engage in, in activities. So, if you would like to engage in sport... What sort of range of sports are available in Selsey? I know of tennis and I know of bowls. What else? Well, I think, first of all, um, you know, there is information available that you can go to on the net uh, yourself to find a list of activities, either really? on the Selsey Information Exchange website or there's a sports stream website. Okay. Um, and the town council also have a directory, as do the library. So, you know, if you want to know something, you can find it out. But, I mean, just to give you a sort of taster, obviously, in a place like Selsey, particularly for summer sports, plenty of opportunity to swim, either in the sea or at Bun Leisure, the Oasis pool. Their gym is available for the public. You can, uh, you know, get fit there, use a personal right. trainer. If you like water but prefer aqua aerobics to swimming, you can find that. Obviously, during the, the summer, there's a lot of cycling that goes on. And with the opening up of the Medmary realignment, there'll be a cycle path right out of Selsey, right up connecting to the one to Chichester. Okay. You can go across the peninsula by uh, cycle or of course you can walk there are lots of lovely local walks that are advertised by the manhood and wildlife heritage mm-hmm. group leaflets there's a local running club the Selsey striders for instance you could do a 5k race locally on uh, june the 7th that's a saturday morning 10 o'clock each speech car park okay. yeah. uh, as well as those sort of summer sports i mean you 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 mentioned things like tennis and and bowls there's golf there's cricket these days for men and women boys and girls really? and of course there are a whole range of, of school clubs that our children and young people get the opportunity to take part in that can range from uh, old sports like stall ball rounders yeah through to hockey uh, 
gymnastics, football, cricket, a whole range of, of things that people can get into. You can do basketball, you can do badminton. Uh, well, obviously, you can do netball too then. Well, you, you, you can do a whole range of things that yeah. are available, as well as, you know, table tennis, indoor curling, a whole range of, of um, opportunities, as well as all the dances, pilates, you know, the exercise classes, fitter sitters, chair-based exercises. There's no excuse not to exercise your body in Selsey. There's plenty available. Okay, so can you think of any sport that you can't engage in in Selsey? I can only think of one, and that's rugby. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are some sports, and rugby is an example, where we're not a, a big enough community to run a club on its own, particularly when there's such a big club in uh, Chichester, and a successful club, of course. In Selsey, we do run school rugby clubs, and there are taster sessions of rugby run by Chichester District Council in regular school holidays. Yeah. Um, so if, if you're interested in rugby, you can get a taste for it, and then you can go into Chichester and, and, uh, and link in there. And that would be the same with more specialist sports. So although you can do kickboxing in, uh, in Selsey, you'd need to go to Chichester for taekwondo, those kind of things. Of course, when you, when you grow in quality, you've often got to go to the bigger uh, central clubs to raise your standard and, and develop you know, as a, a sports person, perhaps to you know, county level and, and beyond. Okay. So, can you just tell me again where you can find out information about all the sports? There's the Celsius Information Exchange in Penny Lane. Yes, or or its website has got there is a directory. So, what is the website? It's www.celsiusinformationexchange.co.uk. Celsius Information Exchange spelled out. Yes, just right. as one word. Yeah. And. .co.uk. Yep, yeah, and fine. you'll find there there is a directory of information giving you every club and group in Selsey with a contact, every activity that goes on, and you can even find a calendar indicating what goes on each day of the week okay. in, in that way. Right. And you can also find at the library, the town hall, Selsey Centre for instance, you know, right. lists of all the activities that are that are going on. So with a little bit of investigation, you, you won't have any difficulty finding out these things. And if you go to the Sportstream website, uh, which is sportstream.org.uk, again, you can find that information. It's readily available and, and, and updated every month. So you can get... Is there a phone number? Yes, 01243201616. And uh, okay. you'll find that uh, that's answered 24 hours a day and you can get some information. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Right. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you, Mike. And Giles ends this week's podcast in the garden. Right, Giles. Good afternoon, Hugh. How are you today? We're all right. Yes, yeah. fine. Up and running. Yeah, well, we're still here, aren't we? I was in the countryside again at this time. Um, primroses and violets and carpets of bluebells are really great to see which, yeah. which is which is one of the one of the nice one of the nice things of this time of year I think and we're very lucky around here because we've got we've got that beautiful nature reserve um, what's it called uh, Langley um, outside Chichester I can't remember the name of it now where there are carpets and carpets of bluebells yeah. Langley Vale I think yeah, it's called right, yeah. and uh, but, I mean we do see them around but they're lovely to see I think and uh, in the fields, there's a lot. Of course, you've got a wonderful spread of uh, of bluebells down at the end of Church Norton, haven't you? Oh yes, I forgot about that. Yes, you do indeed. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course you do. Yeah, yeah, and then and then there's bluebell wood, isn't there? At the end of, yeah, oh, I forgot. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. There, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's well worth a little walk, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, you. Yeah, well, yes, you're quite right. And the fields. Um, a lot of the fields have got uh, loads of red and white clover in the fields now, which are full of nectar, obviously. Which oh, hang on, just a minute. Something, just to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. Did you know that the uh, that Chris Arnold, mm -hmm. uh, who is the wife of Bob Arnold, who's concerned with Celsius Internet Radio, mm -hmm. has orchestrated the planting of 40 million 
poppy seeds throughout Selsey. Oh, for to, the uh, to, 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 to do commemorate with the, the First World War. Oh no, I didn't know that. No, they, they, is there anything special about grabbing poppy seeds, or is you just no, them? no, no? They just chuck them around. Yeah, so just, you, yeah, okay. So you don't have to do anything special. Not really. No. And do no. they self seed themselves afterwards? They should do. They should so do. So forty million poppy seeds. So how's that going to be done? Grip. Sorry? Who's going to do all this and where's it going oh, to be? You go down and you pay fifty pence at the uh, at the town hall, oh, yeah. and they give you and Back they give the you seeds. two thousand two thousand poppy seeds. What to plant in your garden? I presume. Put them wherever you want them. Well, no, or yeah. So, 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 I expect there'll be some gorilla planting on the hedgerows. Well, wherever you can, I suppose. Yeah, have a gardens on in the well, wherever as you yeah. say. Have you taken yours yet? Oh yes, yes, I've got mine. Have you, have you done dealt with them? No, I haven't planted them yet. No, well, you're probably best to wait a bit. No, actually. I thought probably the end of the month. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with you. Yeah. The only thing is, it's not. Don't do. I would suggest to me, don't just throw them about. I mean, it's better to just have a little rake and. Just soften up the soil wherever they're going to go, or, and, and and then sort of rake them, rake them in a little bit, because just throwing them on the surface really, um, I'd say, you're going to lose at least half of them. Um, yeah, they either won't seed or they'll be eaten by the birds or whatever. But it would pay to just spend a little bit more time, you know, um, loosening up the um, yeah. soil wherever you're going to do it. Okay, well, I've, I'm sure anybody who's come to collect their poppy seeds with that all take notice of it but Terry when the poppies are grown mm. and they will and they will produce their own seed pods they should they? do yeah yeah so by the time that we've been at this for two or three years yeah you'll be so, over, so she's going to be like flowers, isn't it will be yeah will be. great okay it will indeed you bang on there anyway i'm sorry to no no me. no i'm glad you did actually because i'll go and collect my uh, seeds now yeah no, I'm glad you did. Were well, you getting them from the town hall? Yeah, oh, I'm very. Thank you for telling me. No, I'm very interested to hear about it. I think it's a very, very nice idea, actually. Yeah, yeah. Lovely idea. The apple and pear blossom, of course, is coming to a bit of an end now, which has been nice to see. And then another little um, flower to look out for in the hedgerows is called scarlet pimpernel, which obviously by the name is a small scarlet flower, and it's it's what they term as poor man's weather glass yeah reason being that it, the petals close in bad weather and only open in fine weather yeah so it's a little very noticeable little well obviously scarlet little flower which is mainly in the hedgerows or the on the sides of woodlands and that sort of place yeah. so keep an eye out for it in the in the uh, garden itself uh, i'd say complete the outdoor sowing now probably of um of half hardy annuals half mm -hmm. which are such as uh, the, well asters and zinnias to yeah. quote but two um that can be done now and um also if you've got any dahlia tubers now and uh, it's a good time to plant them cacti and other succulents can be watered sparingly from now on not every day obviously but as and when maybe once a week if that mm -hmm. and it's a good idea to also once a week give them a little very weak dose of tomato feed okay very weak though very weak if if anyone who's has got loads of daffodils and narcissi and and tulips um if more than six weeks has gone it's all right now to cut down the leaves and and get rid of them because they it won't be doing any harm okay fine now the t tip top tip is uh, moss feed and weed lawns I know you like to hear oh that. yeah right okay so do, if you have done it you can do it again you can do it more than once yeah if you've got strawberries now is a good time to place straw between the strawberry plants many a gardener gets to the top of a ladder and find it has been leaning on the wrong wall <laughs> that's about now on, on the ladder <laughs> okay well thanks a lot Giles we'll see you next week yeah Thank you for listening. We hope you'll join us again next week.